Thank you, guys. Uh, hope I can get through this. Um, I have been amazed at the number of people uh, that have come long distances for this talk. I certainly appreciate it. And some of the names I'm going to, to mention, did uh, we get the title of my talk up there? He is. Uh, first of all, let me welcome everybody, uh, current students and former students. And uh, as I said, they have come, you have come from uh, Indiana, from Nebraska, uh, and uh, even other places that I, did. I don't remember where you're living. Uh, <laughs> uh, now, but and also welcome to friends and colleagues. And uh, if you uh, have ever been in one of our classes, you know what that means. <laughs> uh, I promise that uh, in this talk there will be no proofs, no calculus, no statistics. Um, so I hope to give you a bit of my uh, reflections on my time here and uh, how important I think mathematics is to society. Thanks to God for giving me the strength and energy to, to teach all these years, uh, stay healthy somewhat. Um, thanks to the administration for letting me stay. I've, uh, I have worked under five presidents and over 10 deans. But I've got a special thing for a group of people that get very little uh, honor or thanks for what they do here at the college. They're quite often at work before the rest of us are up. And they're mowing our yards, they're cleaning our rooms, and I want a special thanks for the maintenance crew. Uh, and uh, this is, my last official class was 11 to 12, but I didn't have any math majors in that group, so I requested this time slot, and I'm, I'm appreciative of my colleagues for giving me this uh, time slot. I, uh, I picked this spot because it's almost physically where my uh, first lecture occurred. Uh, there was an old building here called the FAC, the Fine Arts Center, and uh, as Dr. Bundy alluded to this morning, there was a new course uh, he wasn't here in 67 like I was, but we had a new course called Science Thought, new curriculum, new calendar, and whole works. And it was team taught by all the scientists, including mathematicians. And uh, my assignment, I had to give two lectures on this subject, Mathematics, the Language of Science. And I'm not sure how well I pulled that off back then, but uh, um, I could do a better job today, but I certainly know that's, that's the case. A uh, dear friend uh, was near retirement at that time, and his name is Randy Shields, Dr. Randolph Shields in biology. And he and I sort of bonded because he was born and raised in Cades Cove, and I was born and raised in uh, Wallet, which is just up the road a bit. Well, anyway, he, uh, near his retirement, he said, John, uh, uh, I don't know where the time has gone. It's like yesterday I gave my uh, first lecture. And uh, um, so anyway, I feel the same way. It feels like yesterday when I did it. Uh, so the hardest thing for me today is keep it together to get through this. Okay. Um, briefly. Um, uh, I first got to know Maryville College in my high school years. Uh, they, this, uh, Mr. Mac Toller, the chair of the math department at that time, uh, started this uh, statewide math contest. And, and as a high school student, I um, participated in that. And during that time, I got to know Mr. Mac Toller, the chair. And uh, I, did, I had no idea that someday he would be my mentor, my teacher, and uh, uh, actually recommended me for graduate school and to this position of teaching. Um, a lot
lots of stories I could tell about Mr. Toller. Um, and uh, one I have actually used in class. Uh, and it, it, was an, it was just to get the student's attention. Uh, one day after I had taken a calculus test with him, or the day after, or the first day back in classes, he walks in, silent, walks right up to us, he's got the papers in his hand, and he just throws them at us. And the papers go everywhere. And he says, these are the, the worst exams I've ever seen, and I'm going to give a retest tomorrow, and I want to see better grades. Well, uh, that sure scared the Hades out of me. <laughs> and I did do better. I started teaching in the fall of 67, taught two years, and then I got this marvelous grant that let me go back to college or university to do the doctorate, Then I've been here ever since. The person that replaced me, Gary Kubin, is sitting back here today. He chose not to continue teaching. I guess, uh, I don't know what it was that turned him against it, but uh, he ended his career as a park ranger, so he liked the park. Let me talk briefly about my time here in uh, uh, three uh, in three periods. The early years of the junior years. And during that time, I finished my doctorate. I enjoyed the birth of my daughter, Melissa. I was, uh, um, you know, as a teacher, you're also an advisor and a counselor. And I think I did a lousy job at that. And I hopefully will give you an example of that later. Uh, I had always been involved in sports in high school, so I continued that here as a faculty member. And um, I had my own basketball team that competed in uh, intramurals. And the name of my team was called the Sutton Science Team. And we came in second place several times, but we could never beat this team called the Town Rounders. Uh, this was a uh, group of football guys. Of course, it's off season for them in January. And they were pretty much local uh, guys that commuted. And uh, uh, to that basketball career, I can think, uh, you know, my broken pinky, which you all have laughed at from time to time. And I had an ACL tear during that basketball time. Uh, I was actually recruited to play softball for a student team. And I'm sure the students didn't like me that much, but uh, and the reason they recruited me was, was because of my blazing fastball. I was the only one that could <laughs> really whip it. Uh, little did I know that the person that recruited me would be my boss. And it's Wayne Kramer who is the chairman of the board. So you, you never know what's going to happen down the road. Now, I had one claim to fame. Um, is this coming through because I know I'm going to be back? I had one claim to fame as a softball pitcher, and I struck out uh, probably the best athlete that's ever been here to college. Um, and um, he was a uh, quarterback, he was All-American, and he would not admit it today if you could ask him. But I did strike him out. And, <laughs> <laughs> and that guy is Joe Costner, who's a local attorney. Um, he also employs one of my daughters, Amy, who's an attorney. So, um, <coughs> So that was my claim to fame there. Um, I also played ping pong and table tennis. I never lost a turn. The students couldn't be. Uh, Beth is here, Beth somewhere, her, her father. And I must play hundreds of games against each other. He was a student. Anyway, I, I continued sports and enjoyed that. Another thing I did during these younger years was take students to professional conferences. And the absolute strangest, weirdest one we attended was uh, in Dallas, Texas. And we drove there. Three faculty and I think three or four students. Two or three of the people are here today 
Gary Coopin, Judy Penry was on that trip, and Richard Schmock. Is Richard here? There you are, Richard. Uh, I've got this picture of Richard and me in cowboy hats. You should see that. Um, but anyway, that was weird driving that far. We left like 10 a.m. and got there at 3 or 4 a.m. And there's a lot, that's a long story. And got to buy me a drink sometime, I'll tell you the rest of it. <laughs> um, but that was a wonderful trip. Um, and uh, Richard, Dr. Schmack, uh, got his doctorate at the uh, University of Arizona and became the teacher of Jeff Bay, who is uh, uh, the chair of the math department now. Now this other trip, we took to Huntsville, Alabama, and it was a shorter trip. We went down on a Friday morning early. We attend, you know, you attend meetings on Friday afternoon, go to dinner, get up for meetings the next morning and come home. So I'm staying in the hotel on Friday, we're ready to go to dinner. And uh, I see the restaurant down there and a lot of people around it and I'm thinking, you know, I equate a lot of people to a restaurant, good restaurant. Uh, so uh, we decided to walk down there, it wasn't too far. And I'm talking to students, I'm really involved in conversation, I'm not paying attention to what's going on. And we, we start down this long walkway and there's people all around us. And one of my students, his name is Dan Coley, I think he teaches math in Nashville, grabbed me by the shoulder and he says, Dr. Nichols, I think this is a gay bar. <laughs> <laughs> not that I have anything. <laughs> Um, 
so that's a longer story, but uh, if you drive by Bunk Memorial on the left and you see that house, you'll know that the students had a lot to do with, um, with that. Um, we had something when I started teaching called, uh, let me go back, we had, had a new calendar that was very different. We had 10 weeks and, and started in September, then we had a three week term, and then two 10 week terms after Christmas, it's weird. Uh, but those three weeks in the middle uh, between uh, like right after Thanksgiving and before Christmas, we had a term, three week term called the interim. And it was not requested, it was demanded of faculty that you get out of your field and you, you teach something other than, in my case, mathematics. And I loved that. Um, and uh, I did uh, several that I really enjoyed. Uh, and what I really did was create a learning situation. I had to get the resources to our students. So, we spent, I took two different groups to Colonial Williamsburg to study colonial history. We did two interims to uh, build dulcimers, learn to play them. I uh, did two in archaeology and one on what was called What Makes a Car Go. And, and I had 50 students that signed up for that. So that was a great uh, thing. I wish we still had that concept because uh, you know, for the faculty were learners uh, with the students, and you can't ask for it better than that. I had one blooper I wanted to mention. Uh, uh, this was kind of big time because uh, uh, in the 1960s, uh, the universities had these big computers, and they were usually IBM 360s, the big mainframes. And uh, you had to submit your programs on a deck of cards, that's what you did. So microcomputers were just coming into vogue. And we heard here at the college that the University of Georgia had a model lab. So three of us went down to look at it. And the operating system was called CPM. And that was supposed to be the thing in academia. So we came back and somewhere, somehow we found the money and bought ourselves a lab like that. Uh, and uh, it was, we were the only one in the state that had one. Even when we beat, we even beat UT getting it. My mouse going dry. Excuse me. Um, so uh, the TV network is interested in this. Oops. I think I've gotten into the beer first. <laughs> By the way, do you know if I had been drinking a beer in 1961, I'd been kicked out of school if they caught me. <laughs> um, anyway, so the, uh, the first class, the first day of this um, lab, the TV network was here and they were, the film room was rolling. And you had to boot these things with a floppy disk. I'm talking about the three and a half inch, you know, the thing. Everything failed. Everything failed. We tried a second time and then a third. And um, the camera crew laughed and laughed. And obviously we didn't make the news that night. Uh, but then Bill Gates entered the scene. CPM was nothing anymore. And that's when DOS took over. So that's, that's sort of a long story, but that's a blooper I had. My middle years here, uh, I'm one of the architects of the Garbology Project in the January term. Students usually detest that, but after they have done it, it's one of their favorites. You don't believe that, Doug? <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, also, uh, President Dick Farron uh, opened doors that had never been opened to faculty and he released information to me that let me uh, do sa uh, faculty salary reports and long-range planning. I almost got to see the proof of one of the, the famous unsolved problems in mathematics, Fermat's last theorem. I showed that as a video in my last class uh, Wednesday. Uh, it was to be presented there in the early 1990s 
at a big conference and there were like 3,000 mathematicians there waiting for this 300 year old problem to be uh, solved. And we, we sat there and sat there about 10 minutes, somebody finally got up and said, uh, the, he found a bug in his brief. <laughs> and, but about two years later he resolved it and that's the video that we saw. Um, my final years I've been uh, chair, uh, I almost, almost got to see that theorem proof, that's what I like to say. Uh, my final years I spent as the division chair and uh, being a mentor for some of the faculty and helping Jeff Bay become chair. Uh, obviously, some of my favorite courses have been um, Modern Algebra, Linear Algebra, and the history <laughs> of mathematics. Now, I want to tell you a funny story or two, just very brief. Now, one of them is a little longer, but... Uh, <laughs> um, um, and usually, I have some sad stories after that. Uh, and usually you like to do the funny stuff afterwards. It's comic relief, but it's not the right thing to do. In the late 1970s, streaking, you all know what streaking was, right? Streaking was in vogue, and uh, it happened here on this campus quite regularly. We even had a math major that was a streaker, and he was known as the skateboard streaker. And he would donut a ski mask, and here he'd go on the skateboard. And uh, Dr. Carolyn Blair, uh, she was the chair of the English department for a while, and um, then she became dean. And she was on stage like this over in what we call the chapel, at that time Wilson Chapel. And uh, she was um, addressing the students and faculty back when we had everybody get together. And uh, so a, a student with a ski mask, or somebody with a ski mask, comes out of the corner, jumps up and down in front of her like that, and zips out the side door. And everybody gets deathly quiet. Nobody knows what she is going to say. Uh, well, she's sort of like the Johnny Carson type. You never pull a joke on her. I mean, she had the last word on any kind of joke. If you knew Carolyn. Well, so things get really quiet and she finally says, now that we've seen the long and the short of it, let's continue. <laughs> and all I remember about that person uh, was, uh, it was a problem, it was a male for sure. <laughs> Had this little ponytail coming out the back, a little squatty uh, in stature and uh, Speaking of Dr. Bundy, there was uh, <laughs> I looked at the, the attendance report for faculty the next day, and he wasn't there. <laughs> uh, okay, that's enough on that one. Uh, let me uh, switch to a couple of things here, a little more on the serious side. Guys, if you can see me or hear me up above, not God, but, um, <laughs> okay. Um, losing uh, faculty members, uh, faculty members dying, you know, uh, prematurely, students dying prematurely, is always hard on uh, faculty, certainly hard on me. And this guy, um, Russell Parker, uh, was special. And uh, we worked on committees together. We fought really hard to recruit faculty salary. And unfortunately, he passed away before we could, re we could realize that. Uh, he died at a faculty retreat. He had just given a talk on a book that we were going to study, uh, or not study, but uh, discuss during the faculty retreat. And I, I can remember seeing him sitting down after he finished. Program continued, he got up, walked around, and uh, never came back. He died in his uh, cottage of a heart attack. Um, I missed him dearly. Um, he uh, was a very, very popular history professor, and he was uh, secretary of the faculty, among many other things. His love for wife, June, is here. Welcome, June. 
Um, students, losing students is even more difficult, Steve. Uh, about three years ago, uh, Brandon Oppie, one of the most brilliant students I've ever taught in mathematics. Uh, he had everything going for him. He, uh, I had uh, taught a senior seminar in which he was in. And uh, in a seminar, each person takes turns presenting material. And he had, uh, he could present material as good as most any graduate professor, without notes. He uh, had a job at Oak Ridge a Research Lab and was ready for graduate school. But apparently he still had troubles and I wish he could call me. Um, Steve. Uh, Betty. Betty Donahue, 1977. Uh, I was her senior studies advisor. She had done some wonderful work in semi-groups, and in fact, she started. She followed up with Judy's Judy Penry senior study here in, in a field of other things, semi-groups. Um, uh, she was going to present her paper in April at the MAA conference. She had a graduate assistantship, pursued her graduate studies. She came in to my office and Bill Dan, Bill was a chair before me, and she just said, I'm not feeling well. That was the day before spring break started. She said, I'll, I'll get checked out and come back. Well, she didn't come back. Uh, this is the one spot I didn't think I could get through, but anyway, uh, um, her sister said she had terminal cancer when I called, and but she said she's still worried about two things. She's worried about the paper from these obligations and how to handle the assistance. And I said, I'll take care of it, don't worry. And I did, and I presented a paper and made arrangements if and when about graduate school and called the family and told them that and that was finished. And in a few days, she had died, and um, uh, the college did award the, the diploma posthumously, uh, but they said that, uh, I may have to finish that in a minute. Uh, some great memories I have here, just rattle through a few. Raising three daughters, having nine, grand, uh, nine grandkids getting a PhD, getting a full professorship here, becoming chair, watching my students have those what we call aha moments in mathematics, um, uh, watching students, the majors graduate, having, having students come back and say, thanks, that made a difference, you of course did. Um, uh, everybody's heard of the Hatfields and McCoys, that feud, uh, we had a math major from that family, Kim Hatfield, was one of my students. I'd like to brag about that. And uh, another story, uh, I mentioned earlier that I really was not that good of a counselor in my first year. And um, you know, that was one of your responsibilities as a teacher. And there's one person on staff here at the college, I don't think he's here today, but um, uh, he came in early in the term and he was from out of state and had a serious problem back home with parents and uh, wanted my help. And I, I swear, I, I just didn't know what to say. I felt so inadequate uh, and I sort of feel guilty to this day. But in another situation, uh, it was like the last week of classes, the last uh, of the freshman year. I had this young lady and young man come into my office and close the door, and it got me thinking a little bit. I didn't know what it was. And they sit down, and the girl says, I'm pregnant. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, 
Um, I've never advised before a council before. <laughs> I knew I was not going to tell them to have an abortion. Uh, and I did take a little time, talk a little bit, I'm sure, uh, just rambled some. And, but I finally said, thought of something to say. I said, how would you like to go talk with the chaplain? And she, they said yes. And well, I took them over and I sort of moved that problem over there. <laughs> Uh, and I, you know, they did not return to school. Uh, I sort of lost track of them until 18 years later when three people came in my office. Um, I know I still have one thing left up there. Uh, and I'm moving on a little slowly, I apologize for that. Um, there's some things that happen. There, there is a history of Maribel College. There's two volumes of it, actually. But there are some things that will never occur, uh, and, uh, that have happened, that will never show up in a history of Maribel College. And I've witnessed a whole bunch of those. I've been on committees, and uh, I'm not going to go into any details today, but sometime you might want to ask me. But there really is a reason that Maribel College has not had an athletic director from the football community. There really is a reason that we lost our wrestling and our track team that we used to have. There really is, there are several reasons that Dick Farron was a champion of the faculty. There are no good reasons why we lost one of the greatest uh, English teachers we've ever had in uh, Dave Powell. Some of you probably don't remember that. He, did, he didn't die, but he just was not retired. It was just a crazy, stupid decision. Failures, I've had many, and there are too many to mention. Uh, but, uh, you know, the final comment on Betty was that uh, they said that her mind was at ease. Once she knew that those issues had been resolved, she was at ease. A little bit on perspective. That was the second part of my title. And uh, it's, it's really just saying the obvious to you that mathematics is important in society. And I want to quote a few people that not necessarily mathematicians that support that. I mean, anywhere from computers to whatever you name it, it is important. And um, I may not get through as many quotes I plan because there is one story I want to tell. Um, uh, very quickly before I get into that role, I, I do want to say that art and music have been important to me personally in my life, and uh, especially Norman Rock Rockwell, if you've ever seen any of his uh, artwork. I could, and you may have seen these animations before on TV where characters come right out of the, out of the page. I could walk out of many of those pages because I grew up like that. I mean, I grew up as a poor, uh, farm boy and his artwork described my life. But it's not Rockwell that I want to mention, it's Robert Frost. Um, I have lived this poem um, and it was um, called A Time to Talk. I'm not going to quote it to you by any means, but uh, I lived it in the sense that uh, as an eight year old old guy helping my grandfather and there were acres and acres of ground to chop out the weeds. And, and it was getting close to dinner time and we need to get that work done. But good old Mr. Ogle or Mr. Heron or uh, Mr. Keener uh, came by uh, with her horse and wagon or just the horse with the, the harness still on. And they wanted to talk. And they wanted to talk about maybe s switching a pig for uh, a plow or something like that. And uh, Robert Frost speaks to that um, in, his, in this poem. And this is coming to, to, to faculty, well, I guess to everybody, because many of you will be teachers and you'll have kids and you, you want to be able to, to give them uh, some good advice at, at some point. And, uh, um, um, I'm hoping I'm not losing my train of thought here, but um, um, I have. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I guess I, I want to refer back to 
to that example that many times students have come to my office and I've rushed them away. You know, I've had other things to do. But I want my advice to all people that counsel and will counsel is to take time to talk. Um, and you can use that example of the people that uh, I mentioned, the two, the couple I mentioned earlier. Now to a few quotes from mathematics. I won't do all that I planned. But, uh, and I am going to read these. So, uh, Aristotle says to Thales, the, the primary question is not what we do, but how do we know it? And that's started the necessity of the proof, the importance of a proof. I'd rather discover one cause than, and then gain the kingdom of Persia, says Democritus. Um, you know, uh, students always want to know a shortcut to something. Yeah, I, want to, I don't want to do all of that. Well, King Ptolemy once said to Euclid, is there a shorter way to learning your geometry? To which Euclid responded, um, uh, there is no royal road to geometry. So uh, I love that because there's, there's no easy way to do it. Um, bees, by virtue of a certain geometrical forethought, know that the hexagon is greater than the square and the triangle and the whole more honey for the same uh, expenditure of material. That was Pappas of Alexandria. Roger Bacon writes, Neglect of mathematics works injury to all knowledge, since he who is ignorant of it cannot know other sciences or the things of this world. Uh, Isaac Barrow writes, Mathematics is the unshaken foundation and plentiful fountain of advantage to human affairs. Uh, skipping a few. The advancement and perfection of mathematics are intimately connected to the prosperity of the state. You'll never guess who said that. Napoleon. Um, Herman Henkel writes, in most sciences, one generation tears down what another is built. What one is established, another one does. However, in mathematics, each generation builds on the top of the previous. Um, where there is number, there is beauty, writes Proclus. G.H. Hardy writes, a mathematician like a painter or poet is a maker of patterns. If his patterns are more permanent than, uh, than theirs, it's because they are made of ideas. I have more quotes uh, that uh, deal with along with those lines. One more, then I'll stop on that because I have a little imaginary thing I want you to do. Bertrand Russell, a famous philosopher, writes, there was a, a path leading across the fields to New Southgate. I used to go there alone to watch the sunset and to contemplate suicide. I did not, however, commit suicide because I wished to learn more mathematics. Uh, I like that. Um, <laughs> it's kept me alive, right? Um, um, to all you women out there from Descartes, a perfect number is a number that's the sum of its divisors, like six. The challenge would be to find the next one, if you don't know it. Uh, I threw this out to some fourth graders and they figured it out. But anyway, perfect numbers are like perfect men. They're rare, says Descartes. It has nothing to do with uh, uh, the subject at hand. But anyway, I want to <laughs> quote a few people that have touched my life in a way, uh, not necessarily in mathematics. Uh, how many have heard of J.D. Davis? Uh, I noticed there was a J.D. Davis uh, award given this week or last week. I wish you could have known that guy. Uh, he was funny and uh, he was filled with these phrases. And he would pass these phrases along to his students who became teachers and and so on and so forth. So I learned some of these phrases from my high school basketball coach, Leroy Gooden, who had studied with 
uh, JD. And I've used it in my class a few times, they're on students, and it's, uh, I can guarantee you, that's it. <laughs> so when I have a student ask me, are we really going to have a quiz or a test Friday, so I can guarantee you we're going to have one. So <laughs> he had a few others that are not public. Uh, <laughs> I had a, a, a wonderful friend who died in a nursing home, and uh, uh, he had a stroke, but he still was big and strong, had a lot of physical uh, energy, you know, and uh, uh, he had this phrase, that it's not original, I'm sure, but he would say, the hell you say. And if a nurse wanted him to do something, he'd lock himself in that wheelchair and say, that, the hell you say, I'm not doing it. <laughs> And occasionally, just to throw a student off guard, uh, a student came up and said, I'm going to be able to take that quiz Friday. I could go home and water, water my plants or something. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll just, the hell you say? <laughs> and it just throws the student back like that. And it startles them that I did. I didn't let them go home and do that, tell them that story. Um, i got to tell you this about the peanuts. I'm getting really close to the end. Nothing would be uh, perfect without peanuts. Now you've got to close your eyes. And I, I, nothing's going to be up there. <laughs> but you've got to close your eyes and let your imagination roll. And imagine three little people lying on the side of a hill, looking up at the clouds. And Charlie Brown says, What do you guys see? And uh, Lucy says, gosh, I see Isaac Newton. You see all those derivative uh, and integral symbols? Yeah. Uh, what else do you see? Uh, and uh, Lucy says, I see, I see Leibniz standing behind him copying his work. <laughs> what else do you see? So uh, It looks like he's standing on something. What is it? Can you get closer? It, it looks like giants. Oh, they got names. Who are they? Oh, that's Galileo, and that's um, uh, Fermat, and Barrows, and Descartes. Okay, Charlie Brown said, yeah. And he, he um, and they go to Linus, and they said, what do you see? So I see Pythagoras. You see X squared plus Y squared equals Z squared over there. Uh, actually, he's copying it from one of his students. So maybe it's not his own result. And what's that over there? Pythagoras is throwing somebody out of a boat. What, he's holding up a sign, what does it say? Square to two is irrational. <laughs> and uh, they said, Lucy, what does that mean? He says, well, Pythagoras thought all numbers were rational. So anyway, that's the story there. And then of course they asked Schroeder what he thinks. He's lying there, or what he sees. And he says, I see Beethoven, and he's writing the fifth. They finally say, Charlie, Charlie Brown, what do you see? And you know, if you've seen the cartoons, he rolls those eyes and he blinks and he's looking. And he says, I thought I saw a ducky in a horse seat, <laughs> but I've changed my mind. Um, that cartoon was actually used in 1967, right here by a guy named Dave Young who taught chemistry. And I don't remember what his point was. Mine is, <laughs> is that it took even simple-minded Charlie Brown had an imagination and it's taken a, an imagination to bring math and science to where it is today and that's what will push the uh, foundations uh, or the frontiers further. A quote from the scriptures. Um, you won't find this book, Ecclesiasticus, in uh, the King James Version. My son-in-law in Florida can tell you why. He's a minister. And he, he was writing about uh, the ancient, uh, uh, the Holy Fathers, uh, Enoch, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's what he was writing about. I found this quote in the History of Math book. And uh, of course, in the History of the Math book, they were talking about famous mathematicians. So uh, let me offer you these words. And the author was by a man named Jesus, uh, son of Sirach in Jerusalem, but it was about 200 years before Christ. So I quote, All these were honored in their generations and were the glory of their times. 
there be of them that have left a name behind them, that their praises might be reported. And some there be which have no memorial, who are perished as though they had never existed nor their children. You're probably wondering where I'm going with this. Uh, that's, I, I don't put myself out there uh, among the greats. Uh, Terry Bundy mentioned this morning some of the great people at Maryville College, the Shields, uh, the, Ram uh, the Lambert, not the Lamberts. Randy will be there one of these days, but uh, there's, there's those memorable names. I've been here a long time, but I don't consider myself uh, to be any of those uh, memorable people. But uh, there are those that are there. So who will remember me and for what? Uh, if I've given you an F in class, you're certainly not going to forget. In fact, I can cite a public official. Um, uh, if I'm ever at a social gathering with him, you know, he'll get a wine glass, ding, 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 with a spoon, get everybody's attention, put his arm around me and say, hey folks, this is the GDS will be gave me an F in calculus. <laughs> <laughs> He's joking, of course. And, uh, <laughs> uh, I say, you, you deserved every bit of it, you know. <laughs> uh, let me leave that subject, really, in, in the words of Descartes. I hope that posterity will judge me kindly. If there was anything at all that I'm to be remembered for, it's a phrase I've put in all my syllabi, and it is, learn to appreciate mathematics for mathematics' sake. You don't have to have an application to, um, for it to be important. What will I do? I'll do some volunteer work, grandkids, antique store, continue to read and travel. But I want to end with an advertisement. And many of you have seen it. There's several versions of it on TV. And it's a direct TV commercial. And the reason I like it is because it has two components of mathematical logic in it, if I tweak it a little bit. Um, one is called syllogism, or the law of deduction. Uh, you know it as the transitive law. It says that if A implies B and B implies C, then A implies C. But you can put as many statements in there as you want. A by B, B by C, C, and, you know, and A will always imply the last one. So that component is there. The other is called contrapositive. You can take those statements, that chain of statements, and you can turn any two of them around as long as you negate them. So if A implies F, you can say not F implies not A. The trick is to remember the first one and the last one. So I'm going to give you a chain of those, and I want your response at the end, okay? So don't forget the first one. Um, if you do not major in math, then you've got to choose another major. If you choose another major, it might be business. If you choose, another, if you choose business, you'll make a lot of money. If you make a lot of money, you'll want to go to Vegas. If you go to Vegas, you'll lose all your money. If you lose all your money, you'll end up in a roadside ditch. Don't end up in a roadside ditch. Major in?
Dr. Nichols' math genealogy, it starts with um, him at the very bottom, and then it goes from his, um, it was his uh, advisor, okay. I wasn't a huge part of this, so. Um, and then it traces all the way back from their PhD's advisors all the way back to the very beginning. And he has people like Wyvin is in here. Um, she mentioned some of her newly people. And a ton of other people in here that are profound mathematicians that some of you math people not, might not know, but for those of us who are mathy, that's a big deal. So we wanted to present this to him. And then Sarah and I have been asked to say a couple of words for Dr. Nichols as he retires. So what do you say about a man who's seen it all, done it all, and taught it all? With over 40 years of teaching, Dr. Nichols has impacted an innumerable amount of lives throughout his profession. With his deep history in the area and profound passion for math mathematics, Dr. Nichols has been a true blessing to the Institute of Maryville College. His lectures have varied from an in-depth analysis of procedures from the olden scholars, modern day plays explaining the history of mathematics, to horror stories about the terrible proofs the students were tested on. We've all laughed at his jokes, enjoyed his companies, and marveled at his wisdom throughout the years. He's changed our perspective on life and how the subject of mathematics should be evaluated. Now it's time for a new chapter to open in Dr. Nichols' life. Although many of us are sad to see him go, we know that this is a new part of his life will hold many new adventures. So from the Department of Mathematics at Maryville College, we extend our new hope for you and the deepest gratitude for all you have done for us in the, from past generations and the present. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Dr. Nichols, for your contribution to our lives. <laughs> So I'm not going to tell you the story, but you can find out why I was hired. I think it's so, so Dr. Nichols could tell everybody as he was introducing me about my interview talk and circumscribed rectangles. <laughs> you can fill in the rest at my interview talk, yes. What I have, um, what I'd like to present is something that we put together um, here. Dan Ross was really helpful in this, and a lot of people in this room contributed, and I appreciate it very much. And John, we don't have it bound yet, but I asked people to write some memories of you. And what I have here is a big stack of memories. They include people who served on the faculty with John, people who were students here with John, staff, and students from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s. And you would not believe, I had to read them, right, as part of doing this, and you would not believe some of the things. How many lives John has touched, how many fond memories, and everybody saying, what a good man. And I appreciate, you talked about time to talk, and I just want to say, appreciate over these years the time you spent talking to me, helping me, mentoring me into the faculty member that I am and that I hope to be. And I know you don't like to hug, but, but you have to hug me. <laughs> sheets over at the reception if you would like to be added. That's why I didn't bound it. So if you would like something to be added to Dr. Nichols' book, you can go ahead and do that over at the reception. I've been asked to let you all know, and this was really uh, pushed forward by one of John's former students, that we uh, are raising money for a gift to the college on John's behalf because of how he has touched so many of us, which I'm sure there's a room full of people here that would disagree with your last statement about not being one of the great ones. 
Um, the gift will be a, an establishment of a technology fund, and John has been very instrumental, as he alluded to with the story about the CPM, uh, in pushing the college's uh, technology forward so that we could do what we need to do as, as teachers in, in guiding undergraduate research. And the idea of this fund is not to replace the uh, funds in the operational budget, but to uh, supplement them so that we can get the latest uh, additions of software, we can add to that software, and if need be, hardware. And then to recognize John's great contributions in uh, uh, pushing the college's technology forward, we will rename our math computer lab in honor of Dr. John Nicholson.